Hi, everyone. G'day, my name's Michael Chato. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the executive director of NIF. I'd like to begin by acknowledging country um, that we're meeting on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and paying my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, recognizing that sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you to Emmanuel for hosting us, and thank you very much to our wonderful guest and moderator. Looking forward to a, a really excellent conversation. Um, just before we do that, I just wanted to say that um, it, it means a lot for, for everyone to, to be here tonight. I, I personally really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure a lot of people here feel a similar thing, which is that it's quite hard to be a, a Jew, a progressive, a person who cares about Israel right now. It's quite hard to be a person who um, is deeply distraught at the loss of life in Gaza, deeply distraught about the violence in the West Bank, um, and just really at a loss for how we get out of this, this place um, that we find ourselves in. Uh, October 7 was, of course, horrendous and horrific, and, and we condemn in the strongest terms, um, and, and we really sincerely hope that we find a, a future that has a lasting and enduring diplomatic solution with new leadership that can, can build peace. Um, I think the way to that, to my mind, is through the grantees that we support on the ground. Um, we support amazing organizations we have for the 10 years we've been here. Um, we have for much longer than that since we've existed in the US and in Israel and in the UK and in many other places in the world. So thank you to all of you who support NIF and our grantees on the ground. If you haven't yet had a chance or if you'd like to again, um, you can do so by scanning the QR codes on your seats or at the flyers that can be found at other seats. That's also where you can find last night's conversation, which was a wonderful online conversation with Maozi Non and Hamza Awada. I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, but please do scan and, and have a look because I think we're all united by a sense that um, where we are right now is, is quite a hopeless place. But I think we're all united as well around a common shared humanity, a respect for civil and human rights, for justice and equality, and we know that the organizations that we fund, Jews and Arabs working side by side, doctors supporting people regardless of whether they are Jewish, Arab, Thai guest worker, so many other organizations are doing amazing work, and that's the path out of here, because Hamas will come and go, and the leadership in Israel must change at some point, and we sincerely hope that our grantees we know that our grantees will build the future that will actually get us out of there. They've been doing this far longer than I've been around and doing this work. And every time I speak to them, I was there in September, which feels like a lifetime ago. Um, but in September, I was, I was filled with hope and optimism at the resilience of the grantees just doing this amazing work. And, and I stay filled with that hope and optimism. And also seeing all of you, of course fills me with that. So thank you again for being here. I really do appreciate it. Um, I'd just like to say that we did say this would be a one hour conversation. It might run a little bit longer for folks who need to duck out. Please do so. Um, but of course, we'd like to accommodate the wonderful speakers and all the excellent things they have to say. So with that, um, I'd just like to introduce our lovely speakers. Um, rabbi Jeffrey Kamins, OAM, has served as rabbi at Emanuel Synagogue since his ordination from Hebrew Union College in 1989, serving as senior rabbi since 1999. In 1991, he began Australia's first conservative, or Masotti, service, and it's committed to the principles of egalitarianism, inclusion, and diversity within the synagogue and the broader community. With his colleagues, he officiated at Australia's first same-sex religious marriage in May 2018. He's right here. <laughs> He has been committed to social justice projects, particularly concerning refugees and homelessness, as well as an issue, issues of the environment, working with the Australian Religious Response to Climate Change and Animal Rights on the Council of Voiceless and Animal Rights, Organi and animal rights Organization. Joining Rabbi Kamins, we, we will have NIF patron and social entrepreneur, Ronnie Khan AO. Ronnie is the founder of Australia's leading food rescue charity, Oz Harvest. She is a passionate advocate and activist renowned for disrupting the food waste landscape in Australia. She appears regularly in national media, serves in an advisory capacity to government, and is a sought after keynote speaker. Ronnie's mission to fight food waste and feed hungry people is supported by some of the world's finest chefs. 
She is an officer of the Order of Australia, AO, and was named Australian Local Hero of the Year. Her journey is the subject of the... Fe <laughs> <laughs> she has many more wonderful achievements under her belt and a truly personal story to tell about October, which I'm sure we will get into. So thank you for being here. Um, and finally, thank you very much, Lyndall Katz, for being our wonderful moderator this evening. Lyndall is a Jewish peace activist, currently on the NIF Australia board, and has been a supporter from the beginning. She previously worked in the social housing sector. Lyndall and all of our panelists, thank you so much. Please give us a wonderful round of applause for all of them. I think with that we can kick off. Oh, sorry, yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to um, have a brief pre-recorded conversation uh, with, with Mickey Gitson, our Israel director, um, who's on the ground and has some fascinating insights to share. Um, hey everyone, thanks so much for being here. My name is Michael. I'm the Executive Director of NIF Australia and we're incredibly lucky to be joined by Mickey Gitson, our NIF Israel Director. Mickey, thanks so much for being on early in the morning. I just thought I'd start sure. off by saying, um, sure. how are you going? How's, how's things over there? And um, yeah, what can you tell us about uh, today in the life for yourself and for Israelis and Palestinians living this reality? I mean, uh, as you guys can imagine, uh, things here are very complicated um, and hard. I think that uh, Israeli society and definitely life for Palestinians in Gaza, but also in the West Bank has changed dramatically since October 7th. Um, in many ways, um, for many, many other communities around the world and definitely people who are not following that much, um, things, uh, you know, has gone forward since October 7th. And for us, in many ways, everything has changed dramatically in the way we see ourselves, in the way we feel uh, about our neighbors, um, the sense of security. Um, of Israelis, um, everything has changed. Uh, relationships between Jews and Arabs within Israel, and definitely, um, you know, some political, very basic concepts that have been in, in the roots of, of this country since its establishment. And this is very, very deep. Those are very uh, deep changes this, this society has gone through. And I think that we are not fully aware of what does it mean for the future? But for the current moment, uh, we're living in a moment of, of deep change that Israeli society is going through. And it can land in any way, the end of it, it can land in a reality in which Israel is understanding the importance of peace and security through political agreement, agreements, but it can also uh, land in a completely different place in which uh, many Israelis uh, feel that they need the uh, you know, stronger military, and and uh, and we just saw yesterday a conference of, of the extreme right wing that included 50 ministers uh, calling for Jews going back to Gaza. So reality here is very shaky in that matter. Yeah, thank you. Um, it certainly is. And and for those who are watching this at a later date, we're recording on Monday, January 29th. So yesterday being Sunday, yeah. January 28th. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about that um, more optimistic vision that you said it could land on. Let's talk about the Israelis who live in uh, peace and security. Um, what, what's the path there and, and what is NIF doing as, as the organization that cares so fundamentally about this to, to get us there? I mean, um, NIF has always, NIF and, and I think Israelis on, on, on the more liberal side have always been um, very engaged on on political solution for the for 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 the region. We understood um, correctly, I, I should say, that um, this approach of managing the conflict or keep living uh, with the Palestinians under occupation uh, would lead basically to reality that we saw violence will occur uh, would occur, and and we saw it coming in the most brutal and, and painful way. But from now on, the question is, uh, what's the way forward? And there are two answers here. Here, one is is the the clear understanding that we, as civil society, 
as um, political activists need to push stronger and clearer um, to, a vi to a vision that uh, offers security both for Israelis and Palestinians, complete freedom uh, for Palestinians wherever they are, and, uh, and the notion of equality between all the people who live in this region. Now, what, what, what are the political implications? As NIF sees it at the, at the moment, I think that um, we are very much engaged in, in getting more and more engaged in a secure vision for Israel and Palestine, looking at the two-state solution concept and trying to break it into, into clear actions, like how, what, what, are the, what are the actions that need to happen tomorrow in order for this solution to be viable in the future. And, and we've done a few things, and one of them is actually creating a new um, unit that takes two of our grantees, Mitvim and Beryl Katzenelson Foundation, that work on, one works on the more regional and, and international um, security aspects of, 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 of our work, which is Mitvim and Beryl Katzenelson, which are more politically uh, active with, with, the, and with many of the, of the politicians and such on our side. And we uh, built a unit called the, the Peace and Security Unit, uh, which will start working with the Israeli public on, on showing and presenting a different vision. But that's not the only actions we're taking. We're working, trying, uh, we're working with other actors. We're trying to uh, push towards this solution. But I want to say we are very much rooted in pains and concerns that Israeli society has had for a very long time. And I think that uh, we need to take it even more seriously. And that's the issue of how we not only ensure freedom, equality, and democracy, but we also think about security and how we actually think that political agreements can ensure for the long term more secure vision, both for Israelis and Palestinians, but take it very seriously into account. And I think these kind of actions, looking at, at, at peace building through a security lens, it's quite new for NIF, but will be very significant uh, looking towards the future. That's amazing. I mean, we've certainly been talking about how the status quo doesn't make us safe, right? Doesn't make Jews or Palestinians safe. And um, yeah, we, we hate to be right in this horrible moment, um, but but it's it sounds more important than ever to be talking about this security frame. How, how is that? How is that messaging landing? And and how are, the, are these next action steps working with the Israeli public? So um, we're actually one of the things that we're doing that now. We are examining it daily, um, weekly. Uh, we're working with our partner Accord, which is an institute that research um, political psychology and trying to help us uh, message around that. And we're seeing very interesting um, findings in their research. For example, we are seeing decrease um, in the belief of Israelis in the two-state solution or language of uh, uh, Palestinian statehood and so on. But on the other hand, there is a quite significant increase in two things. First of all, understanding that the conflict is not manageable anymore and one needs to determine and go forward into determination of, of the future of the region. And Israelis are much more inclined uh, to think about political agreement, right? The language of political agreement becomes much more um, interesting for Israelis, I would say. Uh, when you take into account a, a possibility for, you know, the American influence in, in the moderate Arab countries and definitely uh, the issue of, of, of the future of, of um, the Saudi-Israeli relations. So you, when you think about it internationally and regionally and speaking the language of agreement, there is a potential for um, more work that can be done on that. But it's not easy, right? Israeli society and definitely Palestinian society is going through a massive trauma these days. And we need to be able to lead them through changes and have patience and understanding that um, the fact that not everyone lands with us at the moment means that we should stop uh, working towards the future we believe is right for us. Um, but we also need to change, right? It's not only uh, pointing at others that need you to change. I think that um, NIF and its allies I've been talking about the need to end occupation for a very long time, and we're still very much there. But I think that, you know, on top of discussing the need to end the occupation, 
we are at the moment that we'll need actually to have a path towards ending the occupation. And what does it mean for Israelis? And what are the influence of this reality on, on Israelis' life? Because um, the concept of living in, in security in this region has been shaken in a way that I think that only people who visited Israel can, can understand. And that's something that we'll need to be able to answer in a better way that we've ever done in the, in the past. For sure. I mean, over here, we hear so much about that, about how it's just a different reality on the ground. And so at times um, we can feel very far away. Um, we are very far away. But people here, they really, they really care. You know, we're turning out to watch this conversation in Sydney and in Melbourne. And so um, we want to know what can we do here in Australia? How can we be supporters and, and the most powerful we can from so far away to make these kinds of changes that you're talking about and to make sure we're seeing peace in our lifetimes? So first and foremost, I think your voices matter. I think that Israel has seen now again and again, the importance of the support it receives from the Jewish community around the world. And I think that supporting Israel does not mean standing with Israeli policy, whatever they mean, or whatever, the, whatever the policy is. I think that pushing towards peace and security, speaking the language of peace and security, trying to explain what does it mean to live in peace and security to your allies and friends is extremely, extremely important. Um, Israelis could not do it this time alone, uh, the international support that we receive both from Jewish communities and from um, definitely government, support the government around the world were very, very um, important. And, and I think that that's the time to stand up with your values and with Israel at the same time. We cannot do it by ourselves. And um, the voice coming from the international community and definitely from the Jewish community is more important than ever. Uh, I, I can tell you for sure that I already see uh, Jewish support uh, on the right wing uh, playing a major role. And I think that that's exactly the time to see uh, the mirror effect on, on the more liberal and progressive sides of uh, Jewish communities. For sure, for sure. That's so important. And, and thanks, Mickey, for, for saying that. Um, and to that end, folks who are watching, please uh, come see me afterwards or head to our website nif.org.au. We've got so many ways to be involved and now really is the time. So please don't, don't miss out on this in incredible opportunity. Um, we on the left do really need to mobilize. Like Mickey said, people on the right are mobilizing and we, we need to show we are, you know, a, a sizable majority of progressive Jews who really care about a uh, safe and secure and peaceful Israel living alongside Palestinians. I um, want to say something about it because, because it's extremely important what you just said. The notion here in Israel is that the right wing is standing with Israel and the left wing is not clear. Like it, it doesn't, it's not clear for Israelis where the liberal Jews are standing when it comes to Israel. And I think that we are allowing or giving a path for many, many diaspora Jews, but also for Israelis to understand that the notion of, of Jewish people or, or Jewish partnership can also come from more left-wing perspective. There is, a, there is a path to do it. And I think that if this voice is um, clear and loud, it will also have impact here. But at the, because at the now, you know, where we live at the moment, the right wing is very, very loud and their support is very clear. And maybe sometimes it's easier to, you know, just to stand with Israel, whatever, whatever it does, whatever, wherever it is. But I think that we need in order to push change, to show that we speak not only on behalf of Israelis and Palestinians sometimes, but also uh, in behalf of our partners around the world, uh, mainly within the Jewish community. It's, it's needed now more than ever because the right wing, as I said, is already uh, acting and acting fast, both on the ground, but also internationally. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I think that's so important. Um, well, look, Mickey, uh, thank you so much for being on. I, I just thought I'd uh, get, ask one more question that I know everyone is, is dying to know, and then I'll let you get on. But um, what, do, what are you holding on to for hope at the moment? What's giving you a, a reason to look towards uh, something optimistic at what's a really dark time in, in our history? The level of action or the willingness of people to act in this hard moment 
is something that I did not expect to be so clear. Uh, people are active uh, on so many fronts uh, and definitely the level of commitment that people here have, um, for example, towards um, releasing the, refu uh, the, the hostages. The issue of the hostages has brought uh, many Israelis to be in action. I think the call for peace, even the, in the darkest time, as our grantees in standing together on the Mbiachad uh, are bringing. Um, I think that uh, um, us organizing, right, bringing together groups and, 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 or, uh, and organizations uh, to build a path forward for the region. Because, again, the level of shock and trauma here is so big that one would expect people just, you know, to keep mute or silent or not to speak up, but actually people are acting otherwise. So I don't mean um, that we're seeing now the path for a better future, but we are definitely partnering and working with those who are willing to work very, very hard for a different uh, reality for this region. And I think that without these forces, there is no hope. But I can reassure you, seeing it from here, that um, our people are more fired up than ever to change reality for both Israelis and Palestinians. And that's the time for us to stand with them because without this action, um, you can really see the path going in a bit towards even more dark and, and gloom reality. And, and the fact that there are so many people who are engaged is the only thing that gives me hope at the moment. For sure, for sure. Well, Mickey, we, we really are standing with you. You know, I, I know we sent more money to our grantees than we ever have before last year. I know that I'm getting more calls for how can I go over and volunteer than I ever have before. And, and I think it just speaks to, you know, new people joining our community, new people standing with us and, and, and more people showing up than ever before. So uh, know that we're there with you. And, and um, we're really excited to discuss this conversation and talk about ways we can keep supporting you and, and keep supporting a better future for, for all who are living in, in Israel and Palestine right now. Um, hey everyone, thanks so much for being here. My name is Michael, I'm the Executive Director of NIF Australia and we're incredibly lucky to be joined by Mickey Gitson, our NIF Israel Director. Mickey, thanks so much for being on early in the morning. I just thought I'd start sure. off by saying, um, sure. how are you going? How's, how's things Hello. over there? And um, yeah, what can you, can you tell me. us Hello. about thanks uh, so much, Michael, the for of yourself and uh, the video? And um, I know for me, while they're settling in, uh, being able to be part of NIF and to uh, hear from Mickey about what's happening on the ground there, even in these really hard times of great heartbreak and, and trauma, is very reassuring that there are all sorts of things that we may not uh, know are happening, happening over there, making a difference. And um, now, we ha now we get to hear from our local leaders about what can and does make a difference. Um, so I'm very pleased to be with you doing this. And, you know, we have two amazingly respected leaders here who care so much about justice and equality and do so in a really different way from our community. You know, Ronnie with civil society and being a, an, a, such an effective activist that we all can learn so much from and do every day. And, of course, Rabbi Hammonds, Jeffrey, who's, you know, one of our spiritual leaders who just shows such commitment to uh, many voices, both here in the synagogue and out in the world, so so good. So I'd like to start with a question for both of you, maybe start with you, Ronnie, about if you can reflect on how it's been for you since the 7th of October in this, this terrible war. I, I understand you were in Israel in early October and, um, you know, how has it been and what sort of dilemmas you might have found, seen that we have been in? Thank you so much, Lyndall. Thank you, Jeffrey, for inviting me and Welcome to all of us, and I wish I had some wonderful insights, but I can share with you that we were in Israel when the war broke out. Um, my sister lives in Haifa, and she was very ill, and on the Thursday, we went to Tel Aviv because we needed to vote for The Voice. The postal vote hadn't arrived, so we had to go to Tel Aviv. And my plan was to be in Tel Aviv on Friday and then on Saturday to go back to Haifa. 
Um, we were woken up very early in the morning with air raid sirens. And because I'd lived in Israel before, I recognized that that wasn't just an alarm and it wasn't just an ambulance driving. And we didn't really actually, even though we jumped up and looked out the window, we switched on the TV. And we saw this happening in front of our eyes because it was actually all filmed from 6.30 in the morning. And there was another siren and we had to run into the miklat or the safe room in the hotel. I never did get back to Haifa. Sorry, to see my sister. Because we couldn't travel. The hotel wouldn't actually let us leave. And... On Saturday afternoon, we had a conversation with one of the staff in the hotel who we'd spoken to on the Friday, and he was a jovial, really interesting man. And on the Saturday when we saw him, he was ashen, and, he's, and he must have known what we didn't know yet, because he said he'd been vomiting and puking on hearing what was happening. And as we were watching TV, we, we were hearing the calls from people on the kibbutzim saying, where is somebody help us, somebody help us. Fast forward, I did, ne I did not get back to see my sister and our flight was due to leave on the Monday. Now we were in a hotel that you saw all the airlines, because a lot of airline staff stayed there. And we just saw cancelled, flights cancelled, flight cancelled. But ours was an El Al flight. Um, and so we actually did leave on the Monday. And we didn't come straight back to, Israel, to Australia. Our trip had been planned to go to Italy. And I'm sharing these details because we arrived in Italy so completely traumatized that we were there to holiday and we were like walking around saying, I think we should look at that building, but how can we look at that building? How can we do anything? Obviously, we're back here. And I'll just share some, well, I won't, I'm going to give Rabbi Kamens a chance, but just sharing that it's been incredibly challenging to be both critical of Israel and supportive of Israel at the same time. And I think that's the hardest thing, really, to have the lens of humanity as well as the Jewish lens. Well, thank you so much, Ronnie. Really do appreciate that sort of detail because for many of us who were here, we didn't have that. Um, and Jeffrey, what about you since October the 7th and what? Well, there's obviously different ways to answer this, whether yes. it's on the personal or the, you know, the larger. But since Ronnie spoke personally, I'll just hold there because we'll be able to do the other and other questions, which is, of course, it was Simchat Torah here on the Saturday night as the news was coming out of what was going on in uh, the Saturday morning. But it was, um, it was incomprehensible and no one really knew all that was going on, but by um, Monday morning, I'll remember, because that's when we do our conversations about Israel, that um, for those of you who were there on that morning, we just sat kind of downstairs in the Heritage Sanctuary in, in stunned silence, which is kind of the um, appropriate response to the horrific events that had happened at that time. And, um, you know, and there was uh, that feeling of shock and trauma and things like that. Um, it, but it didn't take long uh, here in Australia for people to start holding positions clearly, strongly, and differently. Um, and, and not just in the Australian community, but within the Jewish community, and of course within the synagogue as well. And so managing those conversations has been uh, challenging. It's So the ones who, um, there are people who, no matter what the state of Israel does to respond to what 
happened on October 7th. It's not even enough. So there are those. And there were others who, from the very beginning, were saying um, it's called the Israel Defense Force, and that's what they are meant to be doing, is to defending the population of Israel, so they don't need to be going into um, Gaza. They need to be working out how to get the hostages out and you know, pointing out that it seemed a mutually contradictory thing to say we're going to go fight a war and wipe out the enemy and rescue the hostages. Um, and so, uh, and those voices have continued. And I think the further that we've moved away from the trauma uh, of the day, not to say that Jews aren't still very much traumatized, but um, five months later, seeing other realities as well, and the question of how to respond to the trauma of what's happening to Palestinian civilians in Gaza, let alone the violence that's been unleashed with the support or the you know, winky winky or blind eye, whatever it is, of uh, uh, violence against settler, uh, by settlers of Palestinians in the West Bank, more and more Jews are being vocally expressive of their concern about those kinds of things. And what I've been trying to do is to provide uh, safe spaces for people who don't feel that the dominant voice is their voice to be able to have their voice heard. Just following on from that, Jeffrey, can you talk a little bit more about what you've noticed? I mean, here in our communities, both here and else, what, what strengths and challenges? You've talked a little about the challenges, but what strengths do you think we're, we're showing? Um, well, uh, you know, we're wearing the Jew hat. <laughs> um, I think it's, uh, you know, pretty good to have the Jewish community coming together to um, you know, highlight the fact that this began with the taking of hostages and that you know, Ofer Calderon is there. We actually had a young girl who was there. She was one of the few who was uh, released in that uh, first release um, at the first ceasefire months ago. Um, he's still, we assume, a hostage and alive, but no one knows. So I think the way the Jewish community has uh, spoken about that, I think... Um, people feeling deeply connected to Israel and to that being our homeland. For me, that's a very, very um, positive thing. Um, I think that as well, um, being able to start working with other groups and having conversations is very, very good. But if you're going to talk about challenges and concerns, it's um, the shutting down of conversations, the um, saying that if someone questions this, um, they hate Israel, um, they hate themselves as Jews, um, these kinds of things I find quite disturbing and quite concerning. And you know, part of the reason I wanted to speak tonight was to be able to have people here at the synagogue and I guess uh, you know on Zoom or wherever to be able to start having a conversation, and it's really important to create those kinds of safe places. Um, some people in the room know we had a, we have a congregant who, at the very, very beginning, uh, the second week of October, said, uh, and he's written an article um, about this, and he calls it restraint and compassion. And there were people who said, um, if you allow him to talk, we're going to boycott the class. And I thought. How can we not allow a voice that talks about restraint and compassion to be heard right now? And so, uh, and I think it kind of dovetails a little bit, you know, about what Mickey's intimating there is that there are dominant voices that want to um, uh, shut out other voices. And uh, there's a lovely teaching that goes back to the Talmud around the time of the destruction of the Second Temple. And, uh, you know, it's uh, that uh, Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, two great schools of thought uh, following the, you know, different rabbis of their, you know, ancestors, Hillel and Shammai, um, were having consistent arguments. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Elu ve'elu, 
divrei Elohim chayim chem, meaning these and these are, you know, the living words of God. The conversation needs to be broad. This is the most complex, multi-level um, uh, conflict on planet Earth right now. Um, lots of people have a stake in it. And we should actually know the numbers because this week we read Parsha Kitisa, which opens up with a census. And so for a talk I gave earlier at Emmanuel School, I thought, I want to like, take a little bit of a look at the census. And I, I think it's important for us Jews to understand this, that there are about 8.2 billion people on planet Earth. And amount that, you know, pushing the numbers, we get to about 15.5 million Jews. So it's kind of about one out of every 500 people on planet Earth is a Jew. To put that into perspective, in Australia, three out of 100 people are um, identify as Aboriginal people. And think about how many of them you actually know and have relationship with. So when you think about the numbers, and then let's take it one step further, that nine countries hold 98% of those Jews. You know, uh, Israel and um, the United States, you know, almost 90%. And so when you expect world understanding and when you expect, you know, the other to just have natural empathy with you because of the pain you're going through, I think it's a, a bit naive and so I, and especially when people don't know us. So the challenge for me, I think, is for people who are Jews to feel th this is Australia, this isn't Israel. I'll talk about that in a different question. To feel safe, to feel comfortable, to engage in conversation, because no one is going to understand who you are, who we are, what our various thoughts are without your being able uh, to express them. And um, part of that will require, if we expect empathy from others, we need to be very much more expressive about empathy for others. And I've been saying this consistently for months now. I don't think the out there Jewish voice expresses enough pain for the devastation that's befallen Gaza in the war that's being fought there. It, it, you know, both... <laughs> Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, one of, you know, one you were talking about how, um, what some of the voices are, and what I'm hearing is that people's rigidity is part of the pain that both of you talked about, and sometimes we're not recognising that pain. Um, and that certainly this community and all communities have gone through such trauma and grief. And, I'm, and you talked a bit about this when you... Yeah. I, I'd love you to talk more, Ronnie, about ha handling that trauma and grief, both, both for you but also in your position as yeah. a... Uh, Thank you. Uh, yeah. So I have staff members who are... We have a very diverse staff. One of my staff is married to a Palestinian... Mm -hmm. So the day that I walked back into the office, the first person I went to find was her, threw my arms around her, and all we did was hug. There was nothing really for me to say. But a short while after, I went to her to invite her because the marches, the demonstrations were all at their peak with red and green flags all over the place, and I decided, what if we could, if I could create a march where people wore only white, no slogans were allowed, no flags. We just gathered in solidarity of the humanity of all of us. And I formed a little group, including Eliza, who's married to Palestinian, who reluctantly agreed to join the group only because she said the trauma that her husband was going through, he was losing members of family all the time, was so great, that we spoke about it, we enlarged that group, and I can get lots and lots of Jews on that group. 
I cannot get lots and lots of Palestinians and Arabs. And I've got diverse other people, but the, the trauma is so great. And I recognize that. And I just, what we're doing is we're holding that space for when we can do that. And I just didn't want to do it with all Jews because the Jews that I knew I'd attract were the ones <laughs> who would be just like me and I wanted it to be as diverse as possible. So that hasn't happened yet. But I will share with all of you that just what happened to me last week, I was in Parliament House and there was a demonstration outside and there were lots of kafiot walking around and lots of red and green flags. And I chose just to do what I needed to do and didn't actually engage even in the cafe when I saw some of those people. I was not there for that. I was there for us harvest business. And the next day on my Instagram, I posted a post on leadership because that's what came out of my conversations and what I'm looking at. And there was a response to my post that said, are you fucking kidding me? I saw you in Parliament House yesterday, smiling and walking around, when Rafa is about to be attacked. Where is your humanity? You are an abominable Jew boycott Oz Harvest. And it's not the first one I've had since the war. So it's kind of so hard to know how to stand up tall and shout when actually my organization is could get penalized because it's run by a Jew. So that is a challenge and a dilemma that I face daily. You know, it was, do I take photographs tonight as I would if I was in any other kind of panel because I'm proud to be here and I want to be here and I want to have these conversations and I'm inviting them all the time. I met with another beautiful young um, Iranian woman that a Palestinian friend of mine suggested I meet and I'm talking to others. But it's actually not safe for me to share all of that because it's detrimental in my role to the organization that I represent. Yeah. You know, I was going to say, and I find that so tragic, and I think um, you know, I was reading you know, different articles earlier today, and um, I, it's in certain pockets, but the, the cruelty, the obscenity, the viciousness, even though you know, I'm still convinced it's only a small number of people um, that are Got doing a loud this. voice. What's that? They have a loud voice. But they have a very loud voice, and it you know snowballs and snowballs, and it actually has real effect on people's careers, whether they're actors or authors, and it's international, and um, it, those things need to be you know dealt with in you know how they can be, and but I th always think that the best way to move forward is relationally, you know, um, and, and just, and, uh, you know, maybe shut down social media one day, but that's impossible. Yeah, but I will share also that I've been accused of not feeding people in Gaza. They're starving in Gaza. What are you doing about it? Didn't want to tell them by the time my food gets there, it won't be so tasty. I think, you know, you talk, Jeffrey, about the complexity of this, this being the most complex thing on the planet that people are trying to get their heads around with, you know, and, and then you're speaking about um, what's been happening for you personally in your professional life. And I, I think other people have experienced their own versions of that. And in the face of that, um, oh, I do want to say something about last night, those of you who happened to see the um, NIF... Uh, talk last night with um, Mao Zinon and Hamsa Hawadi, one of, one of them said that one of the things that we need to do is, is elevate the voices because 
these voices need to be as loud as the other voices, the voices that are pulling us apart. Um, we need to elevate those voices. But on that note, I'd, you know, as Michael did with Mickey, I'd love to know, do you have hope, number one? What gives you hope? And how can we have hope in this, you know, when we're so grief struck, so traumatised and wanting to see something different? Jeffrey? Oh, okay. Yeah, Jeffrey. Um, so uh, I think human beings give me hope. I think that my experience, so this is not Israel. I think everybody re needs to remember we are not in Israel right now. Um, I have dear friends there and I speak with them. So if we think, you know, it's complicated here, there it's hugely complicated because their people are really dealing with a wartime situation, as Mickey was pointing out, lack of security and a sense of safety, and that's for, you know, um, Muslims, Arabs, Jews, Israelis, the, the whole country, um, or from, you know, the Jordan to the Mediterranean, is filled with traumatized people who live in a sense of fear and dread over what this war will be and what war is next. Um, that is where people are there. And I think it's really important for us to remember that's not where we are here. And so my personal experience of Australia is I walk around with my kippah intentionally. Um, I've been down Queen Street and someone said, uh, you know, um, I just hope you're okay and your you know people are okay walking down my street neighbors have gone out of their way to ask about my well-being and the well-being of the community um, I travel into the city haven't experienced anybody saying anything doing anything and it's clear I'm a Jew I was at um, my doctor earlier my dentist and he was saying that you know a few months ago one of his uh, Chinese patients came in wearing a kippah and he said, I didn't know you were Jewish. He said, no, I'm not. I'm just wearing this, you know, to solidarity. show solidarity with the Jewish people. And so I think it's re because the things that are happening, those voices of hate, are so loud, so nasty, and so repeated over and over and over again, one begins to think everyone out here is against us. So... Ten nights ago, a um, week ago Friday, we had a huge dinner here with leaders of, uh, um, you know, different political um, branches, including members of the Greens Party. Um, we had um, people from the indigenous community, from every faith community, sitting around at Shabbat dinner tables with Jewish people, and it was a very animated and lively conversation because human beings can engage in conversation. We have this fabulous congregant, um, uh, Sam, I'll just call him Sam because that's his name, and uh, he's um, a, a regular on Shabbat and he uh, runs gyms down in the Georges River area. Most of his um, uh, patrons or clients are members of the um, you know, Islamic community, um, most of them from the Middle East. And uh, they hang out together. And he was telling the story of how, you know, after these events, someone was saying something at the mosque about the Jews. And one of these guys said, you can't say that. You know, my, uh, my good friend's a Jew, and that's not how he is at all. And he said, yeah, well, who's that? And he told him who he was. He said, that, he can't be Jewish. Right, you know, because, and that's my point, people don't know who, how can they? We're, we're locked up here in the eastern suburbs um, for the most part. You know what I mean? And, you know, people don't come here, we don't go there. So um, the mayor of George's River, Lebanese Muslim was, man was here back in October. That established other conversations. We've been, I've been going down there for the last, uh, you know, once a month. We'll have a night out in Lakemba. Um, you know, during uh, you know, one of the iftar nights. Um, after Ramadan, we're going to go to the mosque, just like they've come to the synagogue. That's 
also Australia, all right? And when you say, well, why don't they speak out? Relationships need to develop. This is a very complicated time, obviously, it would be for them as well. And how many of us actually speak out the other voice? And if we do, what's the reception from the general Jewish community about that? So it's never easy within your own community to speak out with empathy and love for the other community. It's a huge challenge, and the odds are you're going to get shot down at first until, as what you just said, enough voices become louder and clearer. So you've got to keep the faith yourself um, in doing those kinds of things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was very helpful, and I think something that we can... Um, we, we get to start here to look at where the hope is. But, and what about for you, Ronnie? Where is hope for you and where do you think we can work towards that with you? Um, in a couple of places. Not long ago I had a beautiful opportunity to spend a weekend with a Palestinian by the name of Aziz Abu Sarah. I think some of you heard, might have heard him. And within a second it was like we were brothers. It, it just, we clicked and it was so inspiring to hear his vision around dual narrative. And this was coming from someone, you all heard his story, you know, he'd never met, a, he lived in Israel, grew up in East Jerusalem, but really had never met an Israeli and almost, and you know, his brother was in jail, etc. Anyway, the point is, that gives me hope because I totally believe that if both sides, you know, we, can, we have this dual narrative and if we can share that story together, it's incredibly powerful and there are so many Palestinians and there are so many of us who are willing to stand together and share that story and I think that's important. I speak to my nieces and my family and my friends in Israel and they're already demonstrating and going and, you know, they, they on the one hand, some of them say they just live in their bubble because it's just so traumatic and it's so hard. But there is a light and, and there are those that are standing up and if they can stand up there, then how can we not stand up here? And as I say, I shared my personal dilemma because I represent an organisation that actually needs the broad community. But, you know, I am proud and glad to stand up and say that it is complex and I will always, I, I might, <laughs> no, I was going to share that even in our home we have challenging and difficult conversations. Apparently, I am Chomsky and I call him Snotrich sometimes. <laughs> but the point is, we have to have these conversations and they start at home and we have to have them and I talk with my team and I talk with my staff and that's the best I can do, you know, to, to share that there isn't just one narrative. And there isn't just one kind of Jew, and there isn't just one kind of Israeli, and there isn't just the Palestinian who wants to kill us, and there are people to talk to. And I believe that there are people to talk to. And we listened to a wonderful podcast. Um, I don't know if any of you listened to Unholy, if you've heard of it. It's um, Jonathan Friedland and Yonit Halevi. And it's a Palestinian, Samir, I won't get his surname right, and an Israeli who's a professor who specialized in Middle East and Hamas and understanding. And listening to this man, honestly, first of all, you just land up with hope. It's painful, painful. But there are people like that. And I just want to find them and support them and do what we can. 
Uh, I mean, both of you have really talked a lot about relational as being the sort of key to hope. Um, I am aware it's 8 o'clock, so if anyone needs to leave now, now is your time. But please stay if you can. Um, I just wouldn't mind getting a final word here and then we might get a couple of questions. So uh, anything you want to say maybe around um, um, uh, particularly what we can do, how we can maybe show our solidarity and support for Israelis, for Palestinians, for each other here building social cohesion? Well, I think under this banner <laughs> is one of the first ways. I mean, I really do believe that you know, supporting NIF because it's all about civil society in Israel. So that's kind of a concrete thing. For me, it is about talking, continually sharing my message. And I will get that walk and march happening. We will all wear white. We will not have slogans. We will all stand together. Maybe we'll even sing Kumbaya. <laughs> but I will have to find a very diverse group for us to do it, because otherwise we'll just be talking to ourselves. But, um, yeah, I think... Yeah. Jeffrey, a couple of words on that? Yeah, so I would say yeah, NIF does fabulous work, obviously, always has. Um, and uh, it's strange that it became controversial, the work that it did, uh, because it shouldn't be. Um, and, but there's also, I think people should read, and you know, I'm happy to offline talk to you uh, about uh, 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 human rights organizations that exist in Israel that are working you know, on the front lines to uh, prevent um, uh, olive trees being, uh, uh, you know, uh, uprooted, um, crops being destroyed, Palestinian homes being destroyed, uh, just as a matter of trying to literally uh, terrorize and intimidate people off their land. And um, that's something that I don't want to be having done in my name. So there are organizations like that. As I say, the situation in Israel is complicated. And one of the things of which I'm quite aware is that um, the over 40s, 50s, over 50s for sure, somewhere 40, 50, there starts to be a break um, between, and maybe it's, um, you know, those who have been aware of the decadal changes of the country. Um, and so for, since the uh, 21st century, um, the direction of the state of Israel has become, for many younger Jews in, in particular, more problematic. And it's about um, you know, working out how you talk about dual narratives, how we can allow the multiple narratives within the Jewish community for people who are wondering, you know, at what cost the Zionist experiment um, and at the same time having a conversation about how then do we en enable, you know, 14 uh, million people to live in peace and security with, uh, you know, imagination uh, so that there can be, you know, freedom, security, hope, and dignity for all the inhabitants of the land. Can I also just share, for, I didn't mention Women Wage Peace. I don't know if you know them, and Women of the Sun. Two days before, on the Wednesday before October the 7th, there was a massive get-together that I was invited to go to but couldn't because I mentioned my sister was sick. But I've subsequently am talking with them, and they are so powerful and so brave and so courageous. And if you don't know about them, you know, their founder, Vivian, was one of the people murdered on the 7th of October. But a very, very special organization. Yeah, thanks for those sort of pieces around how, where we can put our attention and see where there's, you know, you talk about all those people in Israel and Palestine who are working together. I mean, probably hundreds. But here too, you know, there are so many people working to do something different in little groups, in bigger groups, trying to get their voices out there. So really appreciate that. We have time for maybe one or two questions from the floor. Of course. <laughs> <Let's>, <laughs> <laughs> no women? <laughs> Just one man. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, the mic's coming to you. Uh, I don't need the mic. 
Yeah, no, you need a mic. People are deaf. Need you mic. need a mic. Okay. So Ronnie's probably shivering, wondering what the other oh, inhabitant of the house might be asking. But actually, and I just want to make a comment, two comments, arising out of what Jeffrey said. Because while you were talking, I thought we're not in Israel. We're outside of Israel. It reminded me of the American election four years ago, arguing with friends about it. You know, how can you do this? We don't have a vote. You know, um, so what we're going to don't get too excited about it. We don't have the vote, so we're not in Israel. The people in Israel are the ones that will make the find the ultimate decision there. But this, un, this last episode of Unorthodox, two Jews in the news, Jonathan Friedland, who wrote The Escape Artist, which is a magnificent book. Can I but, ask if it's a comment to keep it very short, and then uh, we'll come yeah, to questions? I, Thank you. I, okay, so just uh, I think I think that unholy, but the Palestinians, a senior Palestinian. Um, commentator, writer in the East Jerusalem, and the Jewish guy's a professor in West Jerusalem. And that's the first time I've heard a discussion of where they kind of agree roughly on a blueprint for the future. So that's why I sort of recommended that. That's all um, I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks for that. Anyone else? Or are we going to send them home early? <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, Ronnie, um, you mentioned that attack to your Instagram feed and it was sounded incredibly um, angry. Like, can you understand where that sort of rage is coming from when Arabs, Palestinians are like watching on the nightly news of this incredible slaughter and genocide in Gaza? I mean, it's not you, like, I hope you didn't take it personally but you can understand where that rage is coming from, you know, and then, you know, years, decades of occupation. That's the that's groundswell of rage that can become hatred. Absolutely. I understand why the pain is there. I, I guess taking it out on a Jew in Australia <laughs> is the part that I think if they'd have... I would have much preferred that she came and spoke to me. She saw me. They were there. I was there. I would have much preferred they came and had a conversation with me because they would have discovered that not only do I want to hear their pain, I want to share their pain and share our challenges. It's when you get... It's that kind of trolling. And so I totally... I, I, I don't feel... I wasn't injured... It's just a challenge when that's in that public forum when I don't have an opportunity to answer and I don't have an opportunity to engage because in that forum, I will not engage. I would have happily had that person and I just assume it's, there was one person there with green hair, red hair and a kafir and I can only think that's the person I saw in the kafir you know, in that coffee shop. Otherwise, I'm not sure where else I was spotted in Parliament House. But thank you. I appreciate that. But totally recognise the pain that the other is feeling. Thank you. Thanks for those. We're, I think we're finishing up now. Last one. one more? Good. I, I just want to talk about anti-Semitism in Australia and the, and the whole problem that uh, you spoke about there. Um, how racism um, brands everybody the same, and that um, you know in the Jewish community there's such a diversity of views about Israel and about this, and uh, but we're all if you're a Jew you're a Zionist and you're committing genocide. It's just like that connection there. Um, what can we do about that? Um, because to me, uh, you know, you, you reach out to people on the other side and. Uh, and I've reached out to many moderate uh, Arabs and Palestinians, and uh, the the problem is is that it's just a stereotype, and just how we have a stereotype about a lot of them, they have the stereotype about us. What, what what can we do about to stop that as an individual? What can we do? I, uh, I think it's a very very complicated problem because um, the as a, you know the voice that is out there, it's so interesting. You know, we talk about the voice having been defeated, um, but the Jewish community 
has official voices and official voices have given an indication um, or I think they're being heard as saying that what Israel is doing is correct and there hasn't been on interviews, whether it's on television or whatever, expressions of, um, you know, uh, empathy for the devastation of uh, Gaza or, you know, in other words, not either or, this isn't a binary thing, but this is a, a both and, there's real pain on both sides and, you know, the, uh, my heart grieves for and I th don't think those things are being heard in the general community from the Jewish community. And so it's great that you have those relationships, but I think we as Jews also have to make sure what, that we understand, and this is why, uh, you know, this is a different country. We have the support of the government, uh, the politicians, I should say, on every level, for the most part. Yes, what, you know, Jenny Leong said was, you know, highly problematic. I didn't see her retraction to know how um, real it was. Uh, so they're not everybody, but we, as I said, we had members of the Green Party here who were here to, he to listen and to engage in conversation and to try to make a difference, at least on the state level, um, where they operate. And so I think it's, again, getting back into those conversations, uh, you know, being fearless in them, but also empowering other Jewish voices to be heard in the community. And uh, as opposed to um, shutting them down or saying that they're self-hating Jews or that they, you know, hate Israel and things like that. Um, Israel is a highly problematic country right now. Yes, it's in the midst of a war. And at the same time, it has a government that, it's a month ago that talk, but... Mickey referred to the fact that they were talking, uh, more than once there have been statements from members of the government uh, about ethnic cleansing. We just saw a video, and if we can see the video, other people can see the video, for the Minister of Social Inclusion saying, we need to behead Sinwar and you know, uh, kill whoever we can, you know, to do whatever we can to those you know, barbarians. So those things are out there being seen, being heard, and I haven't, you know, do we condemn those? Do we say they may be a minister of the Israeli government, but they don't speak for me as a Jew um, in Australia? In fact, I'm horrified by that. So um, yes, we need to have our interpersonal conversations, but I think we also want to be able to empower people um, who, uh, you know, want to challenge as well. They are part of our complex Jewish community, and as far as I know, they're doing it as Jews um, and, and, you know, steeped in their Jewish values. So I guess what I'm hearing you say, Jeffrey, because if I think about myself, that it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Quite honestly, as much as I'd love to stand up and blast my... Instagram with the inhumanity of what I see plus the complexity. The truth is I can't actually do that. And so, you know, you feel so torn. So it is one-on-one. -on -one. And Bruce, I'll share with you, I had a lunch with a very prestigious uh, a, a banker who, Crescent Bank, a Middle Eastern beautiful human who to clear the air before we sat, I just said, you know, you know I'm Jewish. I know that you're Muslim. So, you know, I just want to say I'm sorry. And he said, look, some of my best friends, you know, some of my best friends are Jewish. David Gonski is my mentor. So it went on. And then he said, and, you know, it's just terrible that Israel's doing genocide. It was like... And we were having lunch. I mean, I nearly choked. And I thought, okay, do I, you know, it's, it's, it, he was, he's been to visit Israel. He loves Israel. But genocide, you know, and I just, I just took a deep breath and said, yeah, that's a very complicated word. Because the truth is I couldn't actually 
go into that conversation right there and then. But it, it, and I, I did follow up. But the point is, I think it has to be one on one for a lot of us. And whilst it feels frustrating, because I would love to use my voice for that, the truth is, I actually can't. Well, we're, I mean, we're so happy to have both of your voices here tonight. I, we have to, we could keep going and um, we need to finish up now, but we will continue these conversations into the future. But I, just the other day, Geoffrey, you had said something like, our biggest dilemma is holding two peoples. And I think that's true, our biggest dilemma is holding two peoples, but I think it's also our biggest strength. And I think you've really, both of you have really talked about that in different ways tonight. And um, I'd really like you to join me in thanking both Ronnie and Jeffrey. And I'm going to hand over to Michael to close off the evening. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, please, one more round of applause for our panellists and, and, for our, and for our lovely moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Just a, a brief story to conclude. Um, I, I, think it, I think it relates to some of what's been said today, this evening. Um, when we were in Parliament not too long ago, uh, we, we kept hearing the same kinds of things. And we, and we heard it from our electeds who, who really had serious concerns about social cohesion, a lack thereof, not letting what plays out over there play out over here. Um, almost as though the, the, the intensity had been turned up higher here than there somehow. That was something we were hearing from horrible stories like, like yours, Ronnie, and, 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 and what some of you have shared as well. And so we said, great, let's, let's do this social cohesion event, and, and we hosted it with um, Allegra Spender, Josh Burns. It was, it was wonderful. Um, but, but at the same time, I thought it really addressed some of the issues, but I, I, couldn't, I couldn't understand... How, how the issue could be worse here than there, and, and I'm certainly not saying it is, um, but, but that the intensity of some of the arguments can feel that way, because at the same time, I had another thing percolating at the back of my mind, which was that Mickey told me that on October 8th, we were the first people, and I mean we, he, he and his colleagues, my friends, were, were at the Gaza envelope, they were in the border kibbutzim, and they were booking hotels for the people who needed homes, because obviously they couldn't stay there, and the government wasn't there yet. They were, they were completely missing in action. It was, it was mamasha chaval. I mean, it was horrible. Um, and the thing that, an, another horrific, among many things, another horrific thing about October 7, of course, is that, as, as Ronnie mentioned, um, so many of the kibbutzim that were decimated are leftist kibbutzim. They, they are where our grantees are, are founded. I, Israel Women's Network, founded by Vivian Silva, a proud NIF grantee, um, and, and it is insane, of course, to, to attack these people. And some of them are not. Some of them are liquid heartland, um, and, and we were there too. And we were booking hotels for liquid heartland and trying to get homes for anyone because, of course, it does not matter at that time. And so there was a gaggle of press that came up to one of the liquid kibbutzim and said, how are you? What can you share? What's, what's going on with you right now? And the, a very Israeli person got very Israeli and, and talked about the government and it was horrific. And to add this, that they were not there on top of everything we've been through, even these bastards from NIF are here. <laughs> and um, I, I think that's really illustrative of, of where we were on October 8th and where we are today, which is we're just, we're just people and we're, we're actually just united around some core concepts that no one should have to go through what happened on October 7, and that no one should be going through the violence that's taking place in Gaza, that's taking place in the West Bank. I, I, I'm sure we're all united around the heartbreak for the loss of life that's occurring right now. So I think that we're united around this desire for social cohesion. I, I think we're united around putting a different perspective forward, showing that there are a diversity of viewpoints because no two Jews, three opinions, uh, similarly the, the Muslim community, the Palestinian community, and so NIF is there to say, we love a deeply problematic place. We love a place that is currently conducting a military operation that is having catastrophic consequences. But we also recognize that what happened on October 7th was horrific, and that Hamas 
needs to be eradicated. The, the, the hostages need to be returned. And so we will continue to advocate for that. We will continue to speak up for the complexity of this situation. And so if you at all support that, I would encourage you to scan the QR codes, to watch last night's event, to give to our amazing, amazing grantees. Um, and I just want to say a, a huge thank you for being here because that is the most important part. So thank you to all of you. Thank you to our wonderful staff, Eve Altman and Max Corman, for making this happen. Thank you to the Emmanuel staff and to Emmanuel Shaw for having us. And, and please give everyone a round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, and of course, there's stickers that uh, say equality. Uh, sorry, not stickers, magnets. Please grab them on your way out. <laughs>